Yes, we will go ahead and look ahead of uh, Big Day, the 59th chapter in the history of the country. But yes, we also do have uh, Senator Inaya Abaribe, who is the Senate's minority leader. Thank you for coming on this morning. My pleasure. Well, the president is uh, in New York. He gave that speech, so we might as well just start from there. Uh, how does that resonate with you, the president's speech? Well, let, let me just say that, well, I listened to the president's speech. Um, I've also read, well, I saw a few clips. I've also read a few things that he said. And um, I, I'm not really bothered about the president's take, which is that some people really want to scam Nigeria under the, for the PNID problem. What I'm really worried about is what processes we have breached before a few individuals got a country um, to have liability for something of this nature. Usually, if you have to do a contract, there are procedures that you must follow. And if it's a contract that involves a foreign uh, company uh, that is coming by way of uh, saying they're supporting you, it also has to go through certain things. And certain institutions are supposed to be part of it. So how did this happen? And how did we fall so low in Nigeria that somebody can commit Nigeria without the Ministry of um, Justice knowing, without the checks that we go from point to point. So that is why, uh, that is what we are bothered about. Um, and so we in the Senate have also taken a position yesterday that we will wait to be fully briefed by the Attorney General of the Federation in following this to know at what point were all these processes breached. Because it's only at that point that you can now hold the individuals <coughs> who did that and you'll be able to exert um, punishment. But the former Minister of um, Justice and the Attorney General of the Federation at the time, uh, Chief Michael Landau has said, you know, even he as AGF was not aware at the time. So maybe that's why the president was saying it is that, that, That's what we're saying. H how could anybody commit Nigeria without the knowledge of the chief law officer of the Federation? And so you should ask yourself, really, uh, and all of us have a, a responsibility to ask ourselves, so how did Nigeria get to the point where somebody can just wake up and commit us um, in the, uh, as chairman of power, yeah, we are uh, in the last Senate. So uh, uh, an issue of this nature uh, uh, also came up and, and is still subsisting till today, where there's a commitment by Nigeria to pay for power, for which we don't even have that power. And it's there up to today. So there are certain things that are going on for which we need to but work, work closely just, together. You know, what do you think about the, uh, the impression or what happens in people's mindset? For instance, we saw that EFCC, they swung into action. There are certain directors in, in, in the Ministry of Petroleum Resources. And, you know, if you look at the amount that they were bribed with, how they had to, or the role they played in all of this, civil service, basically. So it's something that when you read it, you just feel, oh dear. Yeah, that, that, that was it. How did we get to this point? And if EFCC says they are investigating people and they have found out how much money, uh, the figures that are quoted in the, um, in the newspapers, if you take them at face value, then you ought not to commit your, your country to this type of thing for this type Miguel of figures. So. Those, those figures are, are pitans, really. You know? So we really don't know what has transpired, what is going on, how it was done. And so that's why we are asking that before we take some more action, we are fully in support of the way the um, 
the uh, Attorney General and, and, and his legal team are pursuing it, they can go ahead with that, but ultimately you must let us know. So that if there are areas that we need to plug, then that will give us the opportunity to be able to do that. But one thing that we can tell every government and every Nigerian, that thing is this. If anything is too good to be true, it is actually too good to be true. And then you see people still <laughs> committing themselves and carrying up. No, no, no. If anything is too good to be true, it's too good no. because we are being told Nigeria doesn't commit anything. We get value for nothing. That's, that's just what we are being told. And that is a classic scam. <laughs> when you're told that you're going to benefit for not doing any work. Okay. <laughs> well, we're all looking forward to how that judgment will eventually go because the former AGF also spoke about grounds upon which you can officiate the judgments. They think we've got sufficient grounds. But we'll wait and wish them all the best such that when they come in, we'll see. As you say, if we put in place proper structures yeah. to ensure that this never happens, you know, happens again. Mm -hmm. And then speaking about that, uh, the history of this country is, is something that uh, you know, year on year we take a look at things and see in a manner of taking stock where we are, where we are coming from. But then for quite a number of people, they think that we didn't have a properly defined manual in terms of where we're coming from as such. We seem to be wobbling trying to achieve <laughs> the big target such that everybody can indeed thump their chest and say, for this green white flag, I stand. Do you share the same view that we don't seem to have it properly cut out from the start? Well, um, when people look at uh, taking a, a discussion on Nigeria, everybody will look at it from their own perspective. <laughs> and some people will say, let's go all the way back to when the British came. Even some people say, no, 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 let's go beyond when the British came, and, and so on and so forth. But the point really is that Nigeria is a nation that is not working, and everybody can appreciate that it's not working. The point of takeoff is, if it's not working, what do you do? How do you, do you really want a country? Do you want a federation? Do you want what we have today, which is a unitary government? Um, unitary? Yes, we have, we have a unitary government that is... Um, Even though it's a federal system, <laughs> that according is, to our laws. That is covered uh, uh, by something called a federation, but we know that that is not true. Uh, essentially, if you're a federation, that means that you're all contributing. But what we have is not a federation in which everybody is contributing. We have a federation in which a few people are contributing and the rest are a sharing federation where we just sit down there to share. And that's why you, you have talks about devolution of power, restructuring, and so on and so forth. And I can tell you this uh, to bring it very clear. Sometime in the, I uh, think in the seventh Senate, either in the seventh Senate or in the eighth Senate, we had a, um, a debate on devolution of power in order to amend the Constitution. And while we were having that discussion, we also had a vote. And the vote for devolution of power failed. And it failed principally because some of our colleagues from certain sections of the country felt that they, they will lose if uh, devolution of power goes on. And after that vote, I had a discussion with a former governor of one of the northern states. And I sat with him and I said to him, I really need to know why you're so much against devolution of power because it will also affect you positively. And uh, he told me, he said, you know, every month I have, as governor, we used to come to Abuja to get allocation 
of funds from the federal pause. If that is removed, my state will collapse because we, we cannot generate what will uh, give us uh, the funding to be able to run the state. And that gives you an idea of how the Federation is run. I didn't blame him. <coughs> what I blamed was the fact that we had, by um, either choice or happenstance, found ourselves in a situation in which uh, nobody thinks outside the box. Nobody tries to say, how do I win myself from this? Um, with apologies to Kweremadu, he called it a feeding bottle <laughs> but, but <laughs> structure. Is, Senator, is it a function of uh, the system of government we are running or it's just the way we are? Because, I mean, you would also recall, I said many would, that in the First Republic, the different regions were economically vi vibrant and they, they didn't have to depend on the center for anything. Well, you know, some, sometimes you can do something you think is good and you will end up um, taking it to a, a situation where it is no longer viable. At the point at which General Gowon needed to win the war and set things out, that's when they created the 12-state structure. Subsequently, after the 12 state structure, because each of those states was still viable on its own, then every other uh, military regime that came tried to appease uh, maybe uh, constituents, uh, elements within the country, and all that, and continued dividing and creating uh, entities. And now, we find that entities are just not viable. And so each entity now has to wait to go cap in hand every month to be able to have sustenance to service the bloated um, structures. It's not that it can't work. It is that when you get used, and that's why we, we use the uh, simile of feeding bottle. When, yeah. when you get used to uh, just uh, living off something, then you, you are no longer uh, motivated, let's just say, to work for yourself. And we can see this uh, very clearly. Niger State in Nigeria is bigger than the whole of almost uh, Western Europe. Niger State. Yet, just a small part of Western Europe called Netherlands, supply milk to the whole world, and uh, you're able to do, uh, survive. But <coughs> Niger State cannot on its own survive. It has to come here every month. So you ask yourself, with all this landmass, with every other thing that is with you, why are you not focusing on your strength? You know, that in the views of that former governor, it's, 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 it's important because it's more like a window into the mindset. Because we also spoke to some po top politicians you know, of the camera, and they thought when, the way the South or some part of the South have gone about this is part of the problem. Because they feel if you stay in the South and you have meetings in one or two states or two cities, and you don't approach the North because in politics you know about lobbying, you don't approach them and explain some of this in such that they can see the reasons, automatically people will shut it down. Don't they have a point when they say that? Yeah, they do. Uh, I, I, just, I was just giving you the reasons why you will find that efforts being made to change our way of um, life uh, hits a brick wall. Uh, uh, another thing is this. Uh, it's, it's also in the nature of people not to take the hard decisions. It's also in our nature to take the easy way out. And the easy way out is do nothing. Stay on what you have. Drum up 
support uh, <laughs> from mm -hmm. your people. Because anytime anything, you try to cast somebody, say, oh, his people will come out, so drum up support and all that, and then blame the other person for your inability to do the right thing. So yeah. if, if well, anybody yeah. says that you don't have a comparative advantage in this country at a particular zone, you will not be correct. The different uh, federating units, editor, in Nigeria, the states in particular, there is hardly any state in Nigeria that cannot, on its own, potentially stand well. I mean, economically vibrant. Many people have postulated them. I saw a report uh, by a consulting firm that's, that identifies and itemizes the mineral resources, mineral deposits, and agricultural capacity of every state in Nigeria. Is it that, if this is true, is it that the state governors are incompetent or they are not looking in the right way or there is some uh, federal government you know, power that is holding them down? Well, I guess it's a combination of all manners of things. And um, I would say that uh, in, in looking at it, you can't say, oh, these people are... <coughs> no, I'm, I'm just saying this. Yeah. Taking the hard decision, it's always very difficult for people to do. Who's so what they want to do is always to take the easy way out. What is the easy way out? You ask yourself, so we sell as much oil as possible, then we, we come out and then we share, and then we just go. That, that is the easy way out. The hard way is for you to look at your place and ask yourself, what do we do within this, um, this area that we find ourselves? How do we, uh, uh, you just mentioned the, uh, the, the time we had different regions. Now, at a particular point, the Eastern region was the fastest growing economy. And it was based on one simple thing, on palm oil. Now, at that time that it was growing fast and it was on palm oil, the Malaysians came and they took our palm canals and fruits and went back to Malaysia and they have turned it into being the leading exporter. And we now have to, anybody who is a, an importer, um, uh, a manufacturer here, that needs to use uh, palm oil as his base for production, has to import it from outside. So you ask yourself, from one regional government, I think the governments, they are now uh, about 11 or so. They should have been more efficient. But rather, I guess the breaking up of all that has made them more inefficient. And, and that is part of our, the bane of mm. our economy today. But you know, Senator, if that's <coughs> the view that they have, you know, still on that perception that, well, if they don't get revenue from the center, the state will collapse. But there's also been several analyses and several reports that in years to come, oil may not, will not be as viable as it is today. So why don't they see that? Well, I think that is a question I can answer. <laughs> because if political leaders <laughs> is a question in that, that uh, position anybody who is a, a, a head of um, uh, an entity called a state will have to answer. You have to ask yourself, you have a maximum of eight years. How do you impact on it to change the uh, narrative in your state? And um, I, I continue to say, maybe our leadership recruitment mechanism is faulty. And therefore, we end up always recruiting Leaders, but they say politicians <laughs> don't allow the younger ones to to come on board because at the time too the average age was really low. But now there is there is nothing that says younger people are better leaders because we we can take a, a census of um, the state governors we have today. The younger ones are the ones that everybody has an issue with. No, but the country had younger <laughs> leaders at the time. They were the ones who led the country. That is the point. You know, we so, we we really find this very very interesting. 
that um, our leaders in the at that time were very young. They were in their thirties. They were, you know, very idealistic mm -hmm. and all that. So, what is it that has happened to our leaders of today? Must be something. All right. Before, before we go to Just this, a minute. Go. We have four minutes. <laughs> Hold on. You be here. You have a job. But Kaide, go ahead and put your questions in. All right. Thank you, Chamberlain. Now, Senator Barbe, speaking of future leaders, now one of them on social media who is watching you uh, made a comment much earlier. And he said that if a senator, I'll just paraphrase what he said. He says that if a senator in Nigeria says things are not exactly working as they ought to, then that is big deal. Now, you have talked about, you know, the syndrome of going cap in hand, you know, to the federal government. You have said this is perhaps a unitary government that is cloaked in a federal, you know, government ideal. So, I think the person is saying that you are in a position to make laws, to make things work. So I think the question for you or from that person is, what are you doing to ensure that things work as a senator? As a senator. As a senator. Yeah, but, uh, my duty as a senator is that we make laws. We oversight the laws that are already made and for where we uh, make uh, appropriation, we, we look into what they do. So when you're talking about the question of whether that, that is the question that comes to the heart of what I had said before, which has to do with devolution of power and which some of our leaders all over the country today are saying that we must have a roundtable conference to talk about restructuring. And I will just give uh, a very uh, small illustration to show this. If there is an, uh, 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 an, an aspect of insecurity within your state as a governor, you will invite the commissioner of police you will invite whatever military formation is within your state, you will invite the head of that, you invite the director officers. You can sit with them and you can say, okay, this is where I have this uh, report and this is what you need to do and then you must <coughs> quickly go and arrest this situation. They will say yes. They will thank you, salute you and walk away and go and send a signal to their headquarters in Abuja. And so the police commissioner sends a signal to his headquarters in Abuja. Then he waits for the man in Abuja to tell him to approve or not approve what to do. Meanwhile, time is going. Sometimes they may, if it's a governor that uh, somebody in Abuja doesn't like, they will say, don't mind him, let him go ahead with all the problems he's having. And nothing gets done. And so, you are in a federation in which a state governor is supposed to be the chief uh, security officer without the ability to order the security agencies within his state to tackle uh, menace. So what do you do? That is not a federation. That is nothing but a unitary system covered with a veneer of a federation. Well, this is a conversation <laughs> that will keep going on. We'll keep having it uh, because we can't afford to uh, not fix the country or get it right. <laughs> because your future, uh, the young ones, even though Sandy Dutta is, there's no, uh, no what, free lunch. No, no, I'm asking you. I've challenged the young ones. To say, well, uh, in what way are they better? You play Flora, <laughs> for example, young persons who are succeeding in business. No, 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 I'm not saying that young people are not yeah. doing well. Uh, 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 politics, please get me uh, right. Uh, I said young people, they are doing marvelously well. We have young Nigerians, you know, but the question of knowing what to do has nothing to do with age. Food for thought. <coughs> Food for thought. <laughs> we will thank you for coming on this morning. Uh, Senator Enyinaya Baribe is a Senate Minority Leader.